Welcome. Thank you for joining us for First Person Conversations with Holocaust Survivors. My name is Bill Benson. I have hosted the museum's First Person program since it began in 2000. Thank you for joining us today. Through these monthly conversations, we bring you firsthand accounts of survival of the Holocaust. Each of our first person guests serves as a volunteer at the museum. Jewish Holocaust survivors are those who were displaced, persecuted, or discriminated against due to the racial, religious, ethnic, social, and political policies of the Nazis and their collaborators between 1933 and 1945. This included inmates of concentration camps, ghettos, and prisons, as well as refugees and those in hiding. Before we begin today's conversation, I would like to pause and reflect on news emerging from Poland, one country at the center of the Holocaust. I was shocked and saddened to learn this morning that anti-Semitic symbols and phrases denying the Holocaust were discovered spray-painted on barracks at Auschwitz-Birkenau. This attack on the most prominent symbol of the Holocaust is an assault on Holocaust memory and is emblematic of the pervasive anti-Semitism that was at the root of the Holocaust and still plagues our society. It makes our program today that much more meaningful and timely. We are honored to have Holocaust survivor Esther Starobin share her individual personal account of the Holocaust with us. During our program, please send us your questions and let us know where you are joining us from in the chat. Esther, thank you so much for agreeing to be our first person today. Thank you for inviting me. I am happy to share my story and my family's story today. Esther, you have a lot to share with us today in a short period, so we'll start. You were born in Germany in 1937, several years after the Nazi party took control of the country. Although you were too young to remember your life in Germany, Please begin by giving us a sense of your hometown of Adels Adelsheim and your family. I will. Adelsheim, first of all, is a very small place. And my father's family had lived in that area for over 200 years. Mm. My father had been in the First World War and had lost a leg in the First World War. So when he married and came back, he was selling grain. Now, my parents had first lived in Korb, which was another small place not far away, and had moved to Eidelsheim when the Jewish community in Korb was no longer, so they moved to Eidelsheim. And my, as I said, my father sold grain. And in February of 1937, my father was taken to court because somebody claimed he had arranged the trade of a bad cow. When he went to court, the judge called him Jew Rosenfeld, and he, of course, lost the case because by then businesses were being taken away from Jewish people. So he had to pay for the cow, pay the court costs, and he lost his business. Mm -hmm. And that was in February. I was born in April. This was me. Please take note of that dog that I'm hugging. It'll come up later. Okay. <laughs> and, my family, I was the youngest of five children in my family, and my, sis my sisters had, by 1938, been sent away to school because they were no longer allowed to go to school in um, Adelsheim. Esther, we, I think we have a picture of your family to take a look at here. Um, tell us who's who. Okay, I'm the baby, of course, sitting on my mother's right. lap. And my brother, Herman, who was four years older than I, then my older sister, Bertle, my sister, Edie, my dad, and my sister, Ruth. And as I said, my three sisters had been sent away to school by 1938. Herman and I were still at home with my parents. Before before we go on about your sisters moving away and, and what happened after that, tell us um, about your extended family. I believe you had a really large extended family. I did. Both of my parents had nine siblings, so it was a rather large family, most of whom I never really met. But Reinhard Lockman, an, a historian from Adelsheim, has made a family tree. He keeps track of what happened to the few Jewish families that lived mm -hmm. in Adelsheim. Mm -hmm. 
and I have this family tree that actually goes back two or three generations on my, actually on both sides. And he has ascertained what happened to each of my aunts and uncles. And on my father's side, um, three three uncles and one aunt were in the United States. And on my mother's side, one aunt was in England, and I'll be talking about her later. Right. But I, I haven't even heard stories about most of these people. So their names on a family tree to me, which is right. but lots and lots of cousins and uncles and aunts because mm -hmm. of the numbers in your family. Bef tell us some, what the age range was of your sisters. I believe your sister Bertle was the oldest, of course. Yes, my sister Bertle was the oldest and consequently the bossiest. Yeah. And, then <laughs> and, and 12 years your senior, I think, right? She was. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And, that, and Ruth, my sister that was on the end, was the middle child and she always acted like a middle child. And as a former school teacher, you probably know all too well what that behavior is. <laughs> right. She had to know everything and tell you everything. Right. <laughs> yes. Esther, just a year and a half after you were born, on November 9th through 10th, 1938, a wave of pogroms or violent attacks took place against the Jewish population in Germany. These events became known as Kristallnacht or the Night of Broken Glass because of the shattered glass on the streets after the vandalism and destruction of Jewish owned businesses, as we see here in this picture, synagogues and homes. Tell us what the impact of Kristallnacht was on you and your family. Well, my sister- and, and here we see a, a synagogue burning on the night of Kristallnacht. My sisters, as I said, were in Aachen and they had walked to school the next morning and saw the synagogue burning and they were told to go home. Now, in Adelsheim, according to Reinhardt, people came from other villages and a couple of people from Adelsheim joined in and they pulled the Torahs, the holy books, out of the synagogue and burned them. They destroyed the inside of the synagogue and they arrested some of the men. Luckily, my parents' house was not on the main road. Not that there are many roads in Adelsheim, but they weren't on the main road and nothing actually happened to them according to Adelsheim, or according to Reinhardt, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. And in this next picture, um, Esther, we, we see the after effects of the burning of the synagogue in Aachen, and this would have been the synagogue that your sisters would have seen. Yes, from what I've found out by doing some reading, this was the only synagogue in Aachen, and it was quite old, and a you know well-established synagogue, but this is what my sisters would have seen. Mm -hmm. on their way home. I don't know how much, how close they actually got. They didn't really talk about it other than to tell me they were told to go home. They weren't, didn't talk a lot about their experiences. They were told to go home to Adelsheim. I, home to Aachen. No, they go back home to Aachen. Okay. Uh, oh, it was several hundred miles away from Adelsheim. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Esther, before we continue, I'd like to um, let you know that we have viewers joining us from a lot of different places in the U.S. and elsewhere. We have viewers today from Michigan, Arizona, Minnesota, Alabama, and international viewers from Japan, India, Israel, and Malaysia. So a lot of folks from a lot of different places watching and listening to you today. Following the events of Kristallnacht, your parents, along with many other German Jews, were convinced that life under the Nazis had become intolerable and could get worse. This led your parents to make the very difficult decision to send their daughters on a kinder transport to England in 1939. Tell us about the kinder transports and, and what you know about how it's possible for you and your sisters to leave Germany in this, in this way. Yes, in England, the Jewish community and some of the other religious communities went to Parliament and asked if they could rescue Jewish children from the Nazis. And Parliament agreed to that. So the rules were that the kids had to travel alone and there was a 50 pound fee so that they could be sent away from England once the war was over because they didn't want him to stay and take jobs away from English people. Mm -hmm. And then some people from England went to Germany to help organize and the Jewish community in Germany organized. 
what I don't know is how specifically my parents got us, my sisters and I, on the kinder transport. My three sisters, Bertel, Edith and Ruth, left from Aachen. They didn't get to say goodbye to our parents. I mean, the, I've only heard a couple of stories about it. Bertel used to say her ears were pierced the night before because there was an old wives' tale that her eyes would be perfect if she had her ears pierced. Mm -hmm. And they were. She never wore glasses. And Edie just talked about once they left Germany, they were given some food through the window of the train. But they didn't actually talk about what happened specifically. And About their journey as well. And none no, of that, yeah. When they got to England, my Aunt Hannah, my mother's sister, had gone to England earlier and worked as a maid since that was one of the jobs available. So she knew a lot of people in the London area and found homes for my three sisters. Bertel lived with a family that had a place in Scotland, and they went up to Scotland. And then when she was 16, she came back to Aunt Hannah's to work. And that, and at some point after she was back, the police came to the door and they said, "Do you know this man?" And Bertel said, I "Have no idea who it is." And it turned out it was her foster father who'd been working as a spy while he was up in in um, Scotland. This is amazing. This is amazing. Just so everybody understands, so the the family that she found refuge in in Scotland turns out to be spying for the Germans. And as you said to me in the past. What better disguise to hide your spying than to bring in a Jewish refugee into your home? Absolutely. A little child. Mm. Yeah. And Edie lived with a family in London. And then when the bombing started and children were evacuated from London, she lived with another family in the country, this time with a Jewish family. And she always said they treated her meanly and all that. Mm. And when she was 18, she joined the Women's Army, the ATS. And we'll have more to say a little bit about that perhaps uh, later when we get to that. Yeah. And Ruth lived with a doctor and his family in England, in London. And then she also was evacuated to a family and then eventually was sent to a hostel, a place for youth who had no home. She said it was because she didn't do the Hebrew lessons that Bloomsbury House sent for her to do, but I don't really know if that's why. Our family wasn't big about talking about all this stuff, actually. Mm -hmm. So they were all in, in England. It, they went in March of 1939. In March of 1939. Esther, um, I want to uh, take a break to just remind our audience to please share any questions you have uh, for Esther via the chat feature, if you wouldn't mind doing that. And I want to tell you that uh, this, this may be a surprise to you. I don't know. Parlin, if I'm saying her name right, this is Esther, or I'm saying the name right, this is Esther's grandnephew in Washington, D.C., uh, who's viewing you today. I have no idea which of my nephews calls himself Parlin. Well, he, you've got a nephew watching you today. How about that? <laughs> um, so with your sisters having gone to England on the Kinder Transport in March of 1939, um, in June of 1939, just um, three months later, you arrived safely in London on a kinder transport as well as your sisters had done um, several months earlier. W what happened once you got to England? Well, I was placed by Quaker ladies, Quaker. And when I, once I got to London, I was taken by train by Mrs. Eddington, a Quaker woman from Norwich. And she sent a letter to the Harrisons and asked, it, which was the family that I was going to go and live with. Mm -hmm. Originally, I was supposed to go to Wales, but that fell through. And Uncle Harry, Mr. Harrison, worked in a shoe factory owned by a Jewish man who put a sign up on the bulletin board, will anyone take one of these children? And the Harrisons said they would take one of these children. So I came off the bulletin board, actually. That's um, amazing. And, and what we're seeing right now, Esther, if you don't mind me jumping in here, this is... What? Tell us. <laughs> this is the tag that I wore on my trip. Uh, you notice that it says Esther Sarah. Sarah was a name that was affixed to all Jewish women and, and girls. 
by the Nazis to yet one more way to separate us from the rest of the world and the rest of the Germans. It has my name, uh, my birthday, my number, and I'm, I don't really know what the last thing is supposed to be on mm. there. And you actually had this attached to you uh, so folks know knew who you were. Yes, and yeah. my foster mother, Auntie Dot, did say this. So the Harrisons were very fundamentalist Christians. They belonged to a chapel. They they didn't go to Church of England. And I went to live with them. They have one son, Alan, who's seven years older than I, he's exactly the same age as my sister, Ruth. And I went to live with them. When I first got there, I had scarlet fever and I was in isolation. And Alan used to play with me through the window. I was very much afraid of Uncle Harry, which was very interesting because he was a very mild-mannered man. I never heard him yell. So whatever I was afraid of had to be something that had happened in Adelsheim and that. So Auntie Dot got the name and address of my mother in Germany, and she wrote to my mother. And my mother answered her, and I would like to share the letter that... Oh, we'd, we'd very much like you to do that. So this, what you're going to share is a letter that your mother wrote to Dot Harrison, your foster mother in in, in, in Norwich. Yes, and luckily, mm -hmm. Auntie Dot saved everything. If you mm -hmm. were in their house, you knew they saved everything. And she gave me this letter and a few other things when I went to visit. Okay. So, dear Mrs. Harrison... Thank you so much for your kind letter and the postcard of the young lady. Now we are much more reassured as we know that our little Esther is better and we do hope that she will be soon all right again. I can realize that it's not easy for you until Esther is accustomed to you as the little girl clung to her mother so very much, though she is not spoiled at all. Conditions here were such that she couldn't go to anybody else. Esther is a merry child, loves playing with other children. I hope her sisters will be able to come and see her and fetch some clothes. I am so glad that Esther likes your son, and by God's keep, she will soon become accustomed to you. It will also take a little time till she's lost her homesickness. We suffer from that too. But it is more difficult for the little one as she cannot make herself understood. Be patient and she will get over it. The great thing is that she keeps well for we are devoted to her. May God keep her well in a strange land. We had to part because she wished for the good of our children and believe that only our, the hope of seeing them again makes me strong and helps us to overcome. Now I thank you and the young lady who was so kind as to translate our letter. I have written to her, I would have written to her too, but lost her address. Once again, many thanks for the love and kindness and care that Esther enjoys with you and a kiss for our darling. Yours gratefully, Kati Rosenfeld. Thank you, Esther, for sharing that. That is an extraordinarily powerful, uh, poignant, letter, a letter filled with love and caring and very little about what must have been going on for your parents and what they were feeling and experiencing back in Germany. As, as a mother yourself, have you, I know you have, have you, what have you thought about what that must have been like for parents to make that decision? I, I can't imagine what it was like. Um, I, I thought about it when my two daughters were two, three, and when my grandkids were that age. You want your children to survive, but the thought of them surviving without you and you not being with them to guide them is pretty amazing yeah. to be able to do that. And I think it shows such strength. But the other thing that this letter shows is my mother's true belief in God. Mm -hmm. oh, when what was happening to them, they could do, be like that, have that belief and that. So the thing that also surprises me when we're talking about me going on the kinder transport. Why didn't they send Herman? He was six years old. We don't know. We have no way of knowing. I mean, the only thing that 
we can speculate he had been sent away to school, not all the way to Auk, and he was in High Braun, which isn't so far away. Mm -hmm. But when the opportunity came up for them to put the kids on the kinder transport, maybe Herman wasn't around because the Jewish community, from what I gather, really arranged these things. But I haven't been able to find this out. And, and Reinhardt, who's found out a lot of stuff for me, mm -hmm. he couldn't find that out either. So, so unknown why why Herman stayed behind with your parents. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. I know boys were special, <laughs> but not special enough to keep them home at, at a time like that. Right. Right. It, it's kind of hard to know. Esther, let me uh, share with you some comments that are coming in from our audience. Um, here's one. Bless the Harrisons and the British families who took Jewish children in the kinder transports. I never fail to be inspired by these stories of love and generosity. I like to think we would all do the same as the Harrisons today. And here's one from Amy Siegel. I can only imagine how painful it must have been to write this letter. Such brave parents. Absolutely, they were so brave. Esther, um, um, you remained with the Harrison family, of course, throughout the war. In fact, you were there until after the war. Tell us what you remember about your life with the Harrisons. Of course, as you said, when you first arrived, you, you, you recall that you felt afraid of uh, Mr. Harrison, but of course that turned out to not be long lived apparently. So tell us about this photo and then tell us more about what your life was like with them. Well, first of all, I got there in June and the war started in September. So we had to carry gas masks. There was bombing. So we went into a raid shelter. I don't ever remember being hungry. Auntie Dot was a terrific manager and they had a garden in the backyard. We also had chickens, which disappeared at some point. And Alan and I disagree. I said the rats got them. Alan intimates we ate them. One or the other. One or the other. <laughs> One of them. Um, I was very happy there. They really spoiled me and I was definitely part of their family. I, of course, knew they weren't my parents when I was old enough to be aware of that because I was calling them Auntie Dot and Uncle Harry. Right. right. Um, they were very involved in the chapel. Um, the chapel had community activities back then. They were very community oriented. So there were things there. There were other children that I was friendly with. I loved school. I, when I left, I was just at the point of taking the 11 plus exam which would have decided what kind of further education I would have had. And mm -hmm. Alan was a terrific big brother. He let me follow him around. He didn't care that I was there. Um, he, he wasn't jealous that he got this little sister to usurp his place in the family. As, as you said, Esther, you with, by the time you left, you were studying for that next level of education, but yeah. your whole education up to that point had been in English schools. Right. Um, and so you got a good grounding. Do you remember being in school in England? Not really. I mean, Alan and I have had big discussions about how we learn to read, but basically we said we can't remember not knowing how to read. Right. Oh, right. I don't know if we learned before we went to school or not. I don't remember school per se at all, mm -hmm. um, actually. I, I remember there were other girls in our neighborhood that I would walk to school with, and I was pretty good in school, I think, from what Alan and the Harrisons had oh, told. I, I have a hunch you were more than just pretty good okay. in school. Um, Esther, um, during that time, during the war years, uh, while you were out there with the Harrisons and your sisters were obviously in different places, were you able to see your sisters during that period at all? They did come to visit. I think it was mostly after the war. This is a picture of one time when Bertel and Edie were visiting. It is Alan in his school blazer. Edie is right behind him and Bertel there. Sometimes Ruth came and we would we could go on the river there, go rowing and, and that. And Auntie Dot and Uncle Harry were very welcoming. And for Alan, not only did he get a little sister, he got a whole bunch of sisters, which were pretty Four exciting. sisters. <laughs> pretty exciting for him, I think. Wow. And um, the Harrisons didn't 
drink. They didn't dance. They didn't go to movies. Now, I don't know how much of the not going to movies would be economic reasons or not. I had never been to a movie before I came to this country. Um, but it was a happy time for me. I mean, there was a Air Force, an American Air Force base nearby, so there was a lot of activity as far as things, airplanes flying and that. But I didn't remember a time when that hadn't been until after the war. And I was pretty protected. I don't remember hearing news on the radio or reading the papers. And clearly they got papers and they listened to the radio. But I don't remember that. And I don't know if it's kind of to protect me from knowing it. But I don't really remember. Yeah. yeah. Esther, yeah. Um, as you explained, with you, you and your sisters being sent to England on the kinder transport, and the fact that your brother remained behind, what what do you know about the conditions that your parents and Herman faced when they while they remained in Germany at that time? Well, Herman was home from school in October of nineteen forty one for forty for uh, Shavuos, and it was pretty normal for actions against the Jews to happen on Jewish holidays by the Nazis. The Nazis would do these actions on Jewish holidays. So in the whole of Baden, all the Jews were told to assemble, you know, in each village to a different place, each town. They could take one suitcase and they were told to bring enough supplies for three-day travel. So they did do this and they went by truck to a train and then they were on a train for three days. The way I know this, that um, Reinhardt arranged a commemoration of that date and somebody who had been on the transport and survived wrote a letter talking about how it went. So they went to Gers, which was a camp in France. It had been a political camp. This is Gers. That's Gers. And they just rows and rows and rows and rows of barracks. It's, it was very overcrowded. There was a lot of disease and people dying from disease, not enough food, not enough clothing. And my parents and Herman were there. And my parents, one of my aunts was there too. And they worked in the kitchen. Now, my father's leg hadn't been sent with him. And the mayor of Ottelsheim wrote to the company that made his leg. So they had to send him another leg, which to me is amazing. They're sending these people to this awful place. And they want to make sure they have their legs so they can work. And apparently my father got sick and landed up in the dispensary for a while. But while they were in Gers, there was an organization in France, OSE, that took the children out of the camps and they took them to chateaus and places. They fed them, they taught them. In fact, on Herman's immigration thing for the ship, it said he knew French. We were wondering how he knew French, but he was in this place. And then in 1941, they managed to bring a thousand children to the United States. And he came to the United States. This is a picture of him waiting to get on the ship in Lisbon. He's the little boy with his head turned. So there we yeah. have a circle on him. Yeah. Yeah. So when the historians at the United States Holocaust Museum were looking for information to develop the exhibit what the Americans knew they found this picture because and we, that was that was just uh, just a few years ago yes we never knew this and we didn't know exactly because Herman whether he remembered or not I don't know but he would never talk about what right, happened right. to him and I am friends with another historian type lady Lily who wrote a book about someone else who was on this transport. And from her research into the person she was writing about, we know which home, which chateau he was in, and some information. Because when she found out information, she'd find something out about Herman and sending it, send it to us. And then from that information, Herman's girls have been able to find out more information about what happened to Herman. That, that's an extraordinary photograph. And to think that it was discovered just recently is pretty remarkable. And, and, and then you became aware of it. Um, Esther, tell us, so, so here's your parents are still in Gers. Um, 
Herman is rescued by Osei, and then he has the opportunity to go to the United States. You must share with us, though, um, he, what happened when he got to when he got to the United States? I mean, he just goes. He goes, and um, he was originally in a home in New York because he knew he had family here, but he didn't know where they were. I mean, he was eight years old, wasn't very old. Um, and his picture was in a New York paper with his name, and one of our second cousins saw the picture and made the connection. So he was sent to one of our uncles in Washington, D.C., our uncle Sally, and he lived with him, and he grew up as the brother of their son, Hans. And um, he called them mom and dad, which irritated Bertel no end. And in fact, his daughters didn't know they weren't his real grandparents. They weren't their real grandparents until, of course, one of the cousins told them, because all the other children knew, and they probably knew if they thought about it. But that's remarkable that his name is in the paper, and somebody goes, "Oh, that's that's my relative." And um, otherwise, there's, so in some ways, happenstance. Well, also in this article, there was a picture of a, a student from Columbia who was doing some kind of schoolwork, talking to Herman, and his youngest daughter tried to find this person, and he had died just a couple of months mm. before Carla did that. But it. it to me, what's so amazing is that we're finding out information so many years later. Right. So much of what I know, because I don't really remember anything, but I'm the family historian. I, I have found out often because you asked me questions that I didn't know the answer to. And I would email Reinhardt Nardelsheim and he would do research. Right, right. And, right. That, and that's how I, I know and the rest of my family knows a lot of information. Esther, you of course you shared that extraordinary letter that your mother had written to uh, Dot Harrison. Did while you were while your parents were in Gers and they were actually in, in a couple of different camps, um, did you or your sisters hear from your parents while they were in the camps? Yeah, um, Bertel and Aunt Hannah got letters from our parents. In the 80s, when there was a lot of information about the Holocaust, Bertel said, oh, I've got some letters. And she actually had five letters. And my husband had them translated. And it's really all I know truthfully about my mother. My father wrote a couple of lines underneath, but my mother wrote. And it was really interesting. She told Bertel in one letter, make sure your siblings thank the people who are taking care of them, study hard wash behind their ears, all the things mothers say. There was no way Bertel could do that. Right. We were all in different places. She also asked Bertel to write to her family in the United States to see if there was any way they could help them get out of Germany to send money. And in fact, Bertel was sending them money. Mm -hmm. my, in, in the letters, we she, my mother knew, and of course my father, that Herman was in the United States. I mean, in one letter she mentions he's in the Osei home, and then in another letter that he's living with Sally and that, you know, Hans is treating him like a little brother. So they did know that. Mm -hmm. And the thing that, it, a couple of things amaze me about these letters. One, how much parenting she's trying to do in these letters from, from the camps. And then, um, the belief in God, it stayed. I mean, by the last letter Bertel had kept, they knew they were not going to get away. But there's still this belief that God, family, friends, and people would take care of us. I mean, such belief when such terrible things were happening to them, it, I, I find it hard to understand. Not to, I, I'm not sure it's that I don't understand it. I just... Marvel. They were pretty amazing people. Yeah, yeah. Sure sound yeah. like it. Uh, we have a question from a, a viewer, Carmela, and I think she's probably asking the question that everybody watching at this moment is is thinking, and that is, what, what happened to your mom and dad? Okay, they were sent in August 1942 via Drancy, which was a transit camp outside of Paris, to Auschwitz. And then uh, they were murdered upon their arrival, August 14th, 1942. And 
Myrtle knew they were gone when she got the letter back. I don't know if the money was still in it, but she got a letter back that she had sent to them. Oh, and it was a return letter, a return letter. Yeah. It was returned, yeah. Mm -hmm. And we know the exact date and which transport they were on because there's French people have written this book and there's a list of every transport, who was on it, what their names were, where they came from, their birth dates, and that information. So that, I, I don't remember how Bertel originally got that um, mm -hmm. book, but that's how we uh, really know for sure. So as your parents were sent by train to Auschwitz, um, they had the knowledge that their five children were safely in other countries. They so did. They did know that. Esther, in 1947, the war has been over since May, in Europe it's been over since May of 1945, so you're there for a couple more years. In 1947, however, arrangements were made for you and your sisters to come to the United States, uh, and, but the Harrison family wished that you would be able to remain with them. Please, please share with us the letter that your uncle wrote to Mrs. Harrison uh, in response to her request to allow you to remain living with them in England. Okay, and this is my uncle that Herman was living with. Okay. Who had actually also lived in Ottelsheim, but they had emigrated in before I was born, but that year they had come to the United States. So, July 12th, 1947. Dear Mrs. Harrison, after considerable time, we have come to realize no doubt how close you have come to my niece, Esther. We know that she has by this time made you consider your responsibility to Esther as your own. We are greatly indebted to you for all you have done for her and hope there will always be time in her life to write you and keep you informed as to her progress in this country. As you no doubt realize, it is our desire for us to have them all together and to raise all of the children as brothers and sisters should be raised. I want to say again, we are appreciative of all things you have done for her. Sincerely, Sally Rosenthal. And that actually, we never lived together in this country. My brother continued to live with the Sallies mm -hmm. until he went into the army. I lived with Bertel and Edith and Ruth for a little while with an uncle and then with Bertel and Edith when they had an apartment. Esther, what, what do you know about the impact of um, your leaving the Harrisons, what the impact was on uh, the family, Alan uh, uh, and his mom and dad? Um, from what Alan has told me, it was the worst day in their life. Mm -hmm. Alan told me his mother's hair turned gray overnight. Well, I don't think that's exactly true because they clearly knew that I was going to be leaving. And I probably did if I thought about it, but I wasn't a questioning child. Mm -hmm. But in um, June of that year, I had signed, it wasn't exactly a passport. It was some kind of a travel document. And I must have known I was going to travel if I signed that. And also, the last time I went to visit Auntie Dot, she gave me a picture of me in London, a real touristy picture with a beefeater. With a beefeater, yeah. Yeah. And I never looked on the back, but I did a year or so ago. And on the back, it says, we're in London to see if there's a space available for Esther to leave. But it was easier not to acknowledge that I was going to be leaving because I didn't want to go. I wanted to stay there. I was happy there with my family at that point. Do, do you remember actual leaving, uh, actually leaving their home and um, to make your way to the United States? Well, I don't know how much I remember and how much has been told to me. Okay. But the Harrisons, like many families, didn't have a telephone. So Bertel called the police and the police came around and knocked on the door and told them they had to take me to London the next day because I was going to be leaving with Bertel. Ruth had gone the um, week before. Bloomsbury House, the organization that looked after us, had made, made these arrangements. 
So they took me, Alan and Auntie Dot took me to London. Uncle Harry couldn't take the day off work. And it was a day Alan was supposed to get a special award from school, but he went with us and they handed me over a package again. And I went with Bertle to the ship and we were traveling on the Queen Mary, which had been a troop ship. So it wasn't luxurious at that point. And somebody from the royal family was traveling that time. And in England, they were very clever about when they do strikes. So there was a strike for a couple of days. And um, luckily, Bertle had a boyfriend who was a butcher. So he'd given her a salami. My aunt had sent bread and they gave children milk. So um, we were okay. Yeah, and yeah. <laughs> you should always take food when you're traveling. You never know what's <laughs> going to happen. Esther, we, we have a video question from a student. Uh, this is this is from Faith um, from Suffolk, Virginia, and uh, let's let's um, let's watch and hear Faith. Hi, my name is Faith, and I'm from Suffolk, Virginia. Ms. Starvin, before you reunited with your sisters after the Holocaust, had you been hopeful that you would all be together again? Faith is asking: Before you you were reunited with your sisters after the Holocaust. Had you been hopeful that you would be all together again? Not really, because I didn't really remember living with them because they had left Adelsheim when I was a baby in 1938. And I was very happy in Norwich. I would have been happy to stay there mm -hmm. in that. But if I was going to have to come to the United States, yes, being with them would be good. I mean, I didn't know these people that this family had no idea who they were. Right. I mean, Bertle knew Uncle Sally. I don't think she knew any of the other people here. Um, you, this one. You, if I remember right, you were not, all four of you were not on the ship together. One of your sisters came separately, right? Yeah, Ruth came the week before. The week before. And Ruth was your sister who'd been in the British Army? No. Oh. <laughs> She was the middle sister. She was the middle sister, middle sister. Right. Evie was the one in the British Army, and she had to wait to get demobilized from the Army. Okay. And he actually came the day there was a big election in this country where all the newspapers had printed that Dewey had won and then he didn't win. And she was very upset when she got here. No one was paying any attention to her. They were too busy watching the election results. But she came a year later. Uh, that that relates to a question that we were going to have from uh, Tamara, who asks if you were able to be reunited with all of your siblings. So it took until getting to the United States where you actually were all reunited together. And then um, another question before I'm going to ask you in a minute to tell us more about your transition to your new life in the United States. But before I do, um, we have a question and a comment from Deb. Deb says, so sorry for all your losses. And then Deb asks, did you stay in touch with the Harrison family? I did. My sisters were very wise. They made me write letters. I would say I wrote regularly, but I probably didn't. And um, I went, I got to go to college here, which would not have happened in Germany. And I went the summer after I graduated, I went and spent the summer with Aunt Hannah and visited hmm. the Harrisons at that time. But I've always been in contact and they've definitely been part of my life. Um, Alan came here as an exchange teacher one year and the summer after he had been here, we brought the Harrisons over. Once I was married and we had kids, we went, my husband and the two girls and I went back to visit and we did that a couple of times. And then when my kids were old enough to travel by themselves, they went back and have visited. And um, one year I decided I needed to go to Ottelsheim and see where I was born, that I didn't come from a black hole. And we arranged by then, my one daughter was married and my other daughter was about to be married. And we arranged to meet them in Norwich after we mm. went into Germany. <laughs> we, by then Auntie Dot had died and we all went, descended on Uncle Harry and Alan in Norwich, they didn't stay with him. There wasn't enough room. You talk about those little houses. There's one of those little houses. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Uncle Harry's comment was, don't all come at the same time again. It's too hard. 
<laughs> but yes, they've always been part of my life. And once and, and part of your children's life, they really are extended family. They, yes, definitely. Yeah. Once Auntie Dot died, Uncle Harry used to come and spend several weeks in the summer with us. Mm -hmm. And he loved coming. He liked going to synagogue with Fred and participating. He would plant vegetables in my flower bed. He was here probably a week too long, but yeah. Before, before I turn to another question from a viewer, we have a, a photograph of all of you, uh, all the siblings together in the United States. Tell us, about, tell us about this photo, Esther. This was in 1954. Edie, the one without a hat on, um, was getting married. And we looked like a typical American family at that point. Um, Bertel was married. Edie was get no, Edie was getting married. Bertel was married. Ruth was married. Herman was in the Army. And I was in college at this point. Mm -hmm. well, one of the things in the letters that we mentioned before, my mother had told Bertel to make sure we stay together as a family. And Bertel was very Germanic. If you told her something, black and white, no gray with her. So we're definitely a close family. Uh, Ruth and her family landed up in Philadelphia, which isn't far away. And we got together for Jewish holidays, patriotic holidays, and a few brunches in between. Mm -hmm. And really were pretty close. Edie was divorced from the man she married then, and she had another significant relationship, but didn't have kids. The rest of us have kids. Mm -hmm. So my parents would have had 10 grandchildren, and they are pretty close, the grandchildren, not so much the next generation, because they don't live close enough. But that, so that, is, that is such a lovely, and I know cherished, uh, photograph by you. Let me turn to a couple of questions from our viewers, if you don't mind. We have a viewer asks, did you get in touch with other children who were in the trans, a kinder transport? And if so, how did that affect you? Okay, when I was in Norwich, no, but I have found out since then there were 200 children in that area. But the Harrisons not being Jewish, I don't think were connected into the Jewish network. So I don't know if they knew other people, but in England, a woman decided to have a reunion of people who had been on the kinder transport and somebody who went to it thought it would be good to do that in the United States. So I can't remember, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, a kinder transport in the United St Association in the United States was started and my sisters and I went to it and our husbands and it was amazing to meet other people who had had similar experiences. I never knew anybody before. In fact, when I was a kid, I didn't even know the word kinder transport. I, I'm part of a memoir writing group at the Holocaust Museum, and I wrote something about it and sent it to my friend from junior high. And she said, I never knew you were on the kinder transport. Well, we never talked about it. How would she have known? I didn't know that exact. I mean, I knew how I got to England but I didn't actually know the name of it. So it, it was, it, there was an association in Washington, DC, which is area, which is where I live. And it was very nice to get together and meet with other people who'd had similar experiences. Mm -hmm. And there are a couple of plays that people have written and I have spoken at those sometimes. And through that met other people who either they were on the kinder transport of their family so I found that um, it was nice to know other people who'd been through it. And as, as a teenager, I never read a book about anybody who had had anything similar happen to them. And as a young adult, I came across a book by Joyce Carol Oates that I can't remember the name of, with somebody who had lived with an aunt and uncle and had some of the experiences because living with my aunt and uncle was not a piece of cake. It wasn't a good thing somebody who had had some similar experiences and that was so wonderful and now there are many books that have characters right. who right. some way were involved with kinder transport right. esther um tell us just a little bit more about your transition you've come to the united states you are reunited with all of your siblings including herman uh, of course you spoke uh, the king's english uh, by this time 
and 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 what was what was that transition like for you? Was uh, what was it like to go to school here after um, your British education? Well, I first went to an elementary school, and the, it was a really small school. There was six A, six B, and five B, and with one teacher, and she made fun of some of the words I used because they were different. As an adult, I realized she probably didn't like immigrants. It probably mm -hmm. wasn't personal as I took it at that time. But when I went to junior high, I wanted to take Latin. You took a language. My uncle said nah, Spanish. And I thought for years it was because the Spanish teacher was cute. But I <laughs> really think it was because the Spanish teacher was Jewish. And there were two other Jewish kids in the same grade as me. And um, she took us under her wing. She acted, She was a mentor before mentoring was popular. Mm -hmm. That was very useful. Now, I, my sisters and I lived with my aunt and uncle until Berlin and Eve had jobs. Ruth, and, Ruth went off to college. And um, so I went to two junior highs and two high schools. So it was a lot of different schools. The second high school I went to, the German teacher loved everything about Germany. That was really hard. Mm. Oh, I can only imagine. Yes. Oh, oh I, I didn't do well in that class. Mm. Um, but as far as transition, I mean, I in Norwich, we didn't actually live in Norwich when I lived with them. They lived in Thorpe, which was a rural place. So we were living, when I first came here, on North Capitol Street, a major street in Washington, D.C. With When we had streetcars, there was a streetcar outside. So I went from rural to, to urban from Christianity to Judaism, to living with this peaceful, quiet family, to this loud, raucous house. There was my aunt, her mother, two cousins, my uncle, another refugee family, and my sisters. My uncle had a temper, he threw furniture around. My aunt was mentally ill. It was not a very good place to be. So you, you, you indeed had a lot of transitions that you went through. You sure did. Let me let me ask you a couple of questions that have come in from the audience, if that's okay. Uh, a viewer, Amy, asks, um, Esther, in light of the fact that your family didn't want to talk about their experiences, what motivated you to begin to do research? And did it feel scary to learn about the trauma that they witnessed? Um. I think, as I mentioned before, I felt the need to go back to Idelsheim and find out mm -hmm. some information. And then when I retired from, and I did talk a little bit to the kids where I, I taught in the middle school for a long time, but mostly I talked about being in a foster family. And when Alan came over, I dragged him to school with me to talk about that because I had kids who were living in foster families and seemed more, I mean, I, did talk, but not a whole lot about the Holocaust, because frankly, I didn't know so much to talk about. But once I retired and I wanted to volunteer someplace, I started volunteering at the museum. And as I got more involved, as I said before, when first person started and you would ask me these questions and I would be dumbfounded about it. And once my sisters and I, which was a little earlier, had kids, they would want to ask, and my sisters had said answers. And what Bertel said was, you can ask me anything, but if you don't know anything to ask, it's hard to do that. So there were set things. Bertel talked about the fact that our father was very strict. They weren't allowed to have bicycles and things like that because he was afraid they'd get hurt. He inspected their nails. Um, Edie talked about taking her father's watch apart and putting it back together and had some pieces left over, but nothing substantial about what it was like, Right, that kind of thing. Um, they had one story about Aachen that there used to be people in the house at night and they were gone in the morning. So I assume our aunts were helping people get out of Germany. And Edie talked about walking across the border to Belgium and coming back with chocolate and other things stuck in their clothes, mm -hmm. but they didn't talk about it much. And um, I think the more I learned, they would talk a little bit, but um, 
we all did the interviews that were done, but I've never looked at my sister. I've actually never looked at what I said. Oh, either. Okay. Um, several of our family have been back to Adelsheim um, with their children. My children have never been there. My daughter Judy's mother-in-law has been there because she has family that was in that area. And um, in 1940, Reinhardt, in 2000, Reinhardt decided to have a commemoration of the deportation. And Bertel and I decided they needed Jews at it. We quickly made arrangements to go. And my brother's oldest daughter, Renee, came with us. And um, previous to that, we had met a man who came from Rexingen, which is where my parent, my mother came from. In fact, Bertel always had things for me to do. And one day she said, see what you think, if you can find anybody from Rexingen. So I put something out and this- You got it. <laughs> Tim answered, Tim said, yes, I'm from Rexingen, but I'm going to American U in Washington, DC. Mm -hmm. So we met, um, Tim, and in fact, he went to visit at the school where I taught and talked to them about some of the things. And so we, on our way to Adelsheim in 2000, we stopped in Rexing and we saw the cemetery and some of the places mm -hmm. there. And um, I'm trying to think, my niece Tamar has been with her children and Jerry Bertel's daughter has been and Alan's kids, one of his kids has been. So a lot of people have been, and they've written some pretty interesting things about what they know and what they have found out. And I was there with Stacy, my brother's middle daughter. She worked, after Herman died, she worked for Volkswagen and mm -hmm. she wanted to go to uh, Adelsheim and asked me if I would come with her. So I did go to Germany then and went with her. Sir, I have, I have one more question to ask of you. Before I do, I think we have just one more image. It's just a such a nice photograph. Um, and, and this is you and Alan, right? This is Alan and I. I'm wearing a dress that one of my aunts made that's now in the museum. Ah. Okay. And, and that, I mean, it was such a happy time. I mean, it was really the happiest time of my childhood, which is odd to say you're living in a foster family during a war, but it really was. Mm. And, uh, so so my last question, Esther, for you is, in, in the face of rising global anti-Semitism and the news from Auschwitz-Birkenau, it just, just adds to that. Please tell us why you continue to share your firsthand account of what you experienced during the Holocaust. I think it's easy to read a number or to read about it happening to a group but I think to know what happened to individual people and how it's impacted their family and it does it impacts your family it impacts everyone and I think it's really important to know that and the other thing that I think it's important to know that it's you need to pay attention to what's going on in your country in your neighborhood and what you can do to make things I would say better, but I don't even think that's quite it. To make things so they work for everyone, to try and understand and, and help people not feel there for them that there has to be an other. We're all people. Mm -hmm. And, um, I, you know, I think it's so important that we pay attention to what's going on. We can't mm -hmm. live in our that's the common word now, is a bubble, which may be fine, but bubbles collide with other bubbles and not everybody's bubble is fine. So I think for me, knowing how important other people's kindness, even when there was such evilness in the world, that there is evilness and there is goodness going on at all times and do what we can to try to get rid of the evilness and improve the goodness if that makes sense makes total sense esther thank you thank you so much for being willing to share this hour with us to share what you and your family went through um, i especially think your final words are just just so important for us to close out on 
And your image of living in a bubble, but bubbles colliding with each other is exceptionally powerful. So thank you, Esther, so much for doing this. Thank you for inviting me. I'd like to take a moment to thank our donors. First person is made possible through the generous support of the Lewis Franklin Smith Foundation with additional funding from the Arlene and Daniel Fisher Foundation. Please join us again on November 17th at one o'clock when we will be joined by Holocaust survivor Frank Lieberman. When Frank started attending public school, he and the other Jewish students were placed in different classrooms separated from non-Jewish students. Frank and his Jewish peers were dismissed five minutes early so they could rush home to avoid anti-Semitic attacks by classmates. So please join us in November to learn about the efforts of Frank's parents to get their family out of Germany. Thank you all for watching today's first person program.